So it's like it's like half the New Testament all centers around this city. And and so much of the writing either came from here or was concerning here. Uh, and it is it is no small situation here. It is the the epicenter of the coming together of Jew and Gentile. Uh, it is the amazing place of the power of God thwarting the magic of, of those of this age. Uh, all of that is seen culminating in the burning of the scrolls. Perhaps that happened in the Agora, $5 million worth of scrolls up in flames. And then right after that uh, are, are these events. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn over to Acts chapter 19. It says, now after these events, I'm in verse 21, 1921. Now after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit, which is always a good idea, yeah. to pass through Macedonia, right? We just were in Macedonia, and Achaia, which is, which is uh, Athens, Corinth, and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, we'll actually see a an inscription of Erastus when we get over to uh, Athens, which will be interesting, uh, I mean, when we get to Corinth, rather. But uh, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Verse 22, most people think that what happens there are the events of 1 Corinthians 16.10. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 16.10, he sends Timothy off at that point. And in verse 8, right before it, it tells us the time of year. It is before the Pentecost, so it's in the springtime. Why is that important? Because Artemis not only was this incredible temple and you know wonder of the ancient world, 420 feet by 240 feet, 10 steps up to the pedestal, 10 more steps up to the, the temple area itself, columns that were six feet in circumference around, uh, astounding wonder of the ancient world, but it was such a draw for all of Asia. It was the number one cult in the Roman Empire. Uh, Rome, 33 different centers had, had uh, temples to, to Diana, to, to Artemis. Uh, Sardis has, has one where you can see the magnificent size of the columns. We're not going to be able to get over to there. But it's a, a small indicator of what would have actually been in this area here. But why is this such a big deal that, that this is the time of year? Because in April, in that time of year, is when they had the great festival to Artemis. And that festival was Super Bowl, Christmas, 4th of July, <laughs> everything wrapped in together, streets filled to overflowing, bigger than the Jewish festivals bringing people to Jerusalem, were the, the, the festivals of bringing the followers of Artemis to the Mecca of, of Artemis, which would have been here. So that, and then moving on, it says, and about that time arose a, a no little disturbance concerning the way. Now, the way, we, we, you know, we see it actually being called the way when uh, Apollos was, was instructed in the way, right, by Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, a little bit earlier, of course, where, where it talks about um, the, the way here in, in, in Paul's travels. But anyway, moving on. There arose no little disturbance concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, and we just heard a lot of cool stuff on that, and saw perhaps even his silversmith shop, who was a silversmith, and he made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. And again, he would, he would fabricate these shrines uh, for, for Artemis. This is what Ephesus was actually really renowned for as well. Um, but it's, it's interesting that Ephesus would not take threats to the Artemis cult lightly. Right. There was a lot at stake if anything would undermine it. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there is an inscription... That, that was found here, and it, and it dates from several centuries BC, which pronounces death on 45 people from Sardis who maltreated an Ephesian embassy from the temple of Artemis. So to mistreat representatives of our, in this, I'm sorry, that was an inscription in Sardis where you can still see the uh, remains of the temple. But an Ephesian uh, representation group had, had gone there, and because they were mistreated in their duties with, with Artemis, 45 of them were put to death. So you don't mess with Artemis is, is really the bottom line there. And, and so he gathered together the craftsmen with workmen in similar trades, so like gather them all together and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And that the temple received lavish votive offerings. 
Uh, so much so that the temple was not only the center of all cultic and religious activity, but it also became the flashpoint of all patriotism for Ephesus itself. So it's a lot wrapped up into it, not just religious fervor, but patriotism, civic fervor. Uh, this is a great example of civic fervor. This is where the Dimas would, would meet, where all of the people would meet. But on top of that, the, the temple actually became the national bank of all of Asia. Okay. And all of the loans that were given out or, or the deposits would actually occur in the temple itself. So imagine going up, not only up against the established religion of, of a city, but going up against the national bank as well, and going up against the heart of patriotism of it as well. Uh -huh. So when Paul walked down that main street with the gospel of Jesus, he was going right into the teeth of a beast and a half that, that he had to face there. So it's really amazing all that he, that he went up against. Uh, and you see, the verse 26, and here that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great number of people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And he had just done that in, in uh, Athens, uh, in uh, Acts 17, 29. He talks about gods are not some gods made with, with the, the art or craft of a craftsman. He actually goes right after the craftsman himself yeah. in, in 1729. So these guys are rightfully concerned. Yeah. This is not overblowing anything. They know uh, where their bread is buttered, and they know how to protect it at this point in time. Uh, and there's danger that not, not only this trade of ours but that may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may be deposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Very true, they would all pour in here, and, and it was not hyperbole what he's saying here. When they heard this, they were enraged and cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So Demetrius has done a great job. He's, his appeal has had its desired effect. He has marshaled the resources. And in they run to gather the crowds together, whooping them up into the, the, the Demas. It, it is an ecclesia, a gathering. Ecclesia we use for church as well in the New Testament. But it's just the word of assembly, the word of a gathering. Yeah. But anyway, the, the, the gathering occurs here, but it's not a lawful gathering. But he whoops them up into Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. But really what they're saying is, Save our business, save our business. That's the undertone of, of their chant. And why, you think, wow, how, how can somebody chant for two hours? Well, if it's your business that is at stake, and you know that all of this is on the line, plus you kind of stir into the heart of patriotism with it as well, you can see how that whooping could get, get on going after a while there. So when they heard this, they were enraged, cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. city was filled with confusion, rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. And imagine perhaps him even coming down that street and kind of being restrained. And Paul's like, but, but Gaius and Aristarchus are in there. They're my, no man left behind. I'm, I'm going in and, you know, pulling him back. But it wasn't just the disciples. But then it says some Asiarchs. And Asiarchs is, is no small position. The, the number of Asiarchs in Asia, Asia uh, Ark is, is, of course, the word for a ruler. Uh, and it, it's, the, it's those that had significant ruling authority. And there were only one elected in every place where there was an imperial cult. Like what we saw there to Diocletian, to Hadrian. They, they also had them, of course, to Augustus uh, and uh, Claudius. So, so you, you had the imperial cult based here, as well as in probably about four or five other spots. So there were not that many Asiarchs. And if he was friends with Asiarchs, that means that he had friends in very high places, and they knew of what they spoke. And when they said, uh, Paul, you're not going in there, I, I think he recognized that, okay, this is, this is the hand of God restraining me with some very important advice. Uh, they were friends of his, and they sent to him, and they were urging him not to venture into the theater. Some cried out, one thing, some another, for the assembly, the ecclesia, was in confusion. Most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. Paul does that quite often, too, as a, a chance to say, hey, I'm about to say something important, if you guys can just pipe down for one second. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they all cried out with one voice, 
great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Because the Jews didn't put up with the idea of, of uh, you know, ecumenicalism or the idea of polytheism or many gods or, God forbid, the, the imperial cult or even the whole idea of Artemis. Uh, so they, they would have been recognized from well before Paul that the, the Jews were, were also of, of no help in, in this cause whatsoever and they, they weren't uh, eager to be able to listen to him. But then, here's what happens, and uh, as Elam just told us, the town clerk comes. And the town clerk is an important figure here. And while Alexander had no effect on the crowd, the city clerk, on the other hand, he had no problem, as we'll see, quieting the commotion. He was the chief administrative officer of the city, based on, on his title. He presided both over the council of the city magistrates and the public assembly when it gathered, which is a big deal, the, the public assembly. And he was the liaison officer between the city and, this is big, the Roman provincial administration. Uh, his main concern was that to disturb this disturbance would make an adverse impression on Roman officials, possibly leading to restrictions on their self-governance, which of course, you know, while you're under the yoke of Rome, you're always negotiating for your own autonomy all the time. Uh, but in order to pacify the crowd, he begins quite deftly by assuring them that there is no danger to Artemis. And look at what he says. He says, Men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple keeper of the great Artemis, of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? And you've probably read that this is likely the idea of a, of a meteorite. And as a matter of fact, there are two other instances of meteorites that are extant now that we have that we can see that were used in Artemis worship. Um, one, one of them uh, actually was, was taken to Rome in 204 BC, uh, and there's uh, another one that actually is, is also able to be seen. Uh, and again, you could imagine some meteorite coming, looking like the mother goddess, and, and of course then it seems so miraculous, uh, why would you not then kind of have some sort of an idea of, of, of let's see what, how we can honor this thing and ultimately worship it. So anyway, he assures them, hey, everybody knows. I mean, it was, a, it was a sign from the sky. It came from the heavens. Of course we know. Stop with this, like, you know, worrying about Artemis. Artemis is going to be okay. And if you really believe in Artemis, he's basically saying to them, then you don't have anything to worry about if, you, if she is who you really say she is. Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious nor blasphemies, blasphemers of our goddess, if therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. They're pro councils Let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. For we really are in danger. I'm going to get back to that word in a minute because he uses a word play here that's very clever and he shuts down this thing with it. For we are in danger of being charged with rioting today since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Now, what's interesting is that in verse 27 and in verse 40, he uses this word danger. Kidunuo. Uh, it's kindunuo. And in, uh, in, in 27, what, what is said there is by, by uh, Demetrius in the crowd that, that we're in danger not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but the temple of the great goddess, goddess Artemis may, may count to nothing. And then what does the clerk say? Hey, we're really in danger, but really in danger. Not with what you said earlier, but we're in danger of having our status with Rome compromised. And we're in a good place right now, but that's what really could be at stake here. And so with that, he's able to shut it down and Paul is then able to kind of go on uh, with the rest of his, his missionary journeys. Church continues to flourish here. Uh, amazing things that, that continue to be able to happen. The conversions are remarkable. All of Asia from this point is able to hear the word of the Lord from the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Astounding place. Just take it all in because you will read so many of the New Testament books and so much of it has to do with this place right here. Either Paul wrote so many significant letters from right here, some of the most theologically profound statements that you know and inform your faith were penned right here or they're concerning events that occur right here as well. And especially with all of the racial strife that goes on in the U.S. right now and churches that are all white or all black or all anything, which is a, a, a travesty. That, that a church could be all one thing or another. 
to, to look at the church in Ephesus as the church that broke through and did not separate, but really maintained the integrity of the Holy Spirit and the right. unity of the Holy Spirit, Jew and Gentile, su such an amazing place. Yeah. Uh, we are blessed to be able to be here.